Welcome to SVG TV News for Monday, April 3rd, 2023. I am Rochelle Batiste with the details. An agreement was signed here today between the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries and the Japanese government to assist with the development of the local fisheries industry. Speaking at a signing ceremony for the Economic and Social Development Program Agreement for Fisheries Development, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, Nerissa Gittins Macmillan, said that the agreement will extend the relationship between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Japan partner from a very long time ago and for that I say up front we are exceedingly grateful. This morning's activity focuses specifically on the signing of an agreement where once again Japan would come to the aid of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to provide some much needed assistance in providing equipment for us. We pledge our support, we give you our word that long after this activity has ended and long after you have returned to Japan, that your assistance would mean make a significant difference in the lives of our fishers. We don't see it as just a project, but as a means of enhancing the livelihoods of our fisher folk in particular, and naturally by extension, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Again, I say thank you very much, and we look forward to continued assistance and a fruitful relationship. Thank you. Ambassador of Japan to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Mashubaru Yatanka said the grant assistance from, for the fisheries equipment is valued at approximately 2.3 million U.S. dollars. And we will we'll see the local fishing industry benefit from the procurement of equipment to ensure the efficiency and the sustainability as a vital economic sector. This valuable project joins the other cooperative programs presently being carried out with St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the areas of healthcare, technical capacity building, as well as some sargassum uh, management. These projects, together with many other initiatives carried out since the establishment of diplomatic relationship in 1980, a testament to the long-standing relationship which our two countries have been enjoy, enjoying based on shared universal values, including human rights, democracy, rule of laws, and of course, the sustainable use of marine living resources. It therefore gives me great pleasure to share with you that Japan has de designated the memory year 2024, next year, as the Japan CARICOM Friendship Year. And we have exciting plans to facilitate exchanges with St. Vincent and Grenadines and the Caribbean regions Expressing gratitude to the Japanese government, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Soboto Caesar, said hard working fisher folk across St. Vincent and the Grenadines will benefit greatly from the fishing equipment. The persons who will be benefiting from this project are not in the room today. They are on the rough seas of Kanawan, Union Island, Windward and Leeward coasts. They are, some of them are returning with fish to ensure that we have food security and food sovereignty in our country as we speak. And uh, I am happy that this information will get to them because it is very important that the entire population, that we are aware of the solidarity and the working relationship, the cooperation 
that continues between the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the government and people of Japan. Over the last five years, we have witnessed, because of the hard work and diligence of the chief fisheries officer and her staff, and all stakeholders in the fisheries sector that our fishers are doing far better than ever before. Minister Caesar said the fisheries industry here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is one with significant potential. The ministry has embarked over the last year on a fleet expansion program, fleet expansion initiative. The program is oversubscribed. We have over 130 applicants for pirogs and for tuna vessels. At this juncture, I want to also encourage the youth of our country to get involved in the fisheries sector. There is going to be a period over the next three months where we are going to source the requisite human resource capacity so that we can have the needed technology transfer to the fishers in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to be able to operate these tuna vessels, to be able to stay out at sea for a longer period of time, so that we will not only be a major transshipment point for fish harnessed on the high seas by foreign flagged vessels, but that we will be able, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, to develop what will be considered an indigenous fleet flagged by St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where we will work within the legal framework set by international law, and we'll be able to harness the opportunities and possibilities which are available. Regional travel continues to be a challenge for Vincentians. The issue was discussed on SOD TV's Viewpoint program last evening. One of the panelists on the program was country manager of the travel agency Going Places Travel, Karen Charles Samuel, who said while people want to travel, it is quite challenging to get from one island state to the next. You can get on a plane from here to Miami, like just so. To get you to Tartola yeah, yeah. is a nightmare. Yeah. I have begun telling people when you have to travel to these places, you have to try and make your arrangements at least in a, a month before. You can't come now for now, right. say, okay, I need a booking done for tomorrow to Tartola, you're not going to get it. So these are the things we are seeing. The schedules um, for regional travel, you know, they had, every day we had a flight going as far north to San Juan and far south to to, to Trinidad, we no longer have that. You know, St. Vincent Trinidad has been impacted a lot. Only Caribbean Airlines does that route, and that route is sometimes two or three times per week. And the same case like Trin um, Tortola, you have to make these bookings far in advance to get a reasonable rate. I've seen rates go up to $4,000 to get to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And sometimes myself as a travel agent, I don't like to quote these fares to our passengers because that is just scary. This is more than a flight to England. Oh, yes. It's easier to get to England in some cases than to Trinidad. Why is that? Yes. So, you know, this is the things that we have seen since the demise of Liat. Yeah. Now, Liat is back some sort. They do have weekend flights, but they're not flying to Trinidad. And there are some, there are flights, some flights to Barbados, some to Grenada, but it depends. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't come to me as a travel agent and say, I want to go on the 13th, come back on the 15th. Sometimes there are no flights. Mm -hmm. We have to tailor according to the flights in the system right. and not what you, the customer, may, what may, have, may have wanted. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that we are seeing right now when it comes to regional travel. Another panelist on the program was President of Liat Workers Union, SVG, Jeremiah Howard, who said people have underestimated the value of Liat 1974, which collapsed almost three years ago. As we say, um, hindsight is 2020. 
And one of the things that I think we took, we took for granted is that from my last figures I got when I, was, when I used to attend meetings, 70% of Liat's revenue was from intra-regional travel. Mm -hmm. That's 70%. That tells you the volume of, of the movement. Mm -hmm. And who could have imagined in this day and age that to get to Grenada or Saint Lucia would have been this difficult? And I think we are actually too laid back to fill that void and to get up to speed because all the, all the reports are telling you that um, travel from now till 2027, I think I saw a war report about that, is going to be like sky high. People are going to be moving. And we are suffering as we are. We hear these stories. Um, we hear these stories almost on a daily basis about having to go to Miami to get to Antigua. Um, in some cases, people still call me for that to help them to get to certain places. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how much more can we really do with that? But so it's this situation needs urgent, urgent attention from the authorities' um, level. Yeah. On filling the void, Howard said he believes then and still holds the view now that a private sector government partnership in an airline operation is the right mix. What the private sector, I believe, should have the majority shares. Our airline is critical. And there was a there was the famous statement made by our Prime Minister one time when he said, um, Liat is not a business. But he wasn't, he wasn't really wrong when he said it. It is a business. But I think he was just as, as artful in how he delivered it. By that I mean, if you, like, airline travel is so critical to the region. Governments, I think, should have a say mm -hmm. in the airline. So it's not the normal type of business. Mm -hmm. right. Like, say, like a factory or like a bank or the case. Maybe. Right. It's different. I think that is what he, was really, what he really meant. Mm -hmm. It's not a regular type of business. Right. But I am of the, I mean, these international airlines, American and so forth, they have government, government interventions and mm -hmm. subventions and so forth. Right. So a lines are too critical and they are too complex in some cases without having the help of the government in the background to support you one or the other policy and so forth. Right. It's, right. it's important. Yeah, and I was just reading um, an excerpt from the last CARICOM head to meeting where mm -hmm. the Prime Minister of St. Kitts, he said we failed CSME when mm -hmm. we don't provide the free movement exactly. mm -hmm. yeah. of people and services and mm -hmm. You know, that's not happening now. So, in essence, he, I'm thinking the governments, the prime ministers of the Caribbean, they know what is happening, they know where the fault is, they know where it lies, but we don't see anybody, you know, coming forward and saying, let's band together, let's yeah. help back to get Liat back. Yeah. Because I would think, I would want Liat back. And we have so many clients calling, we what? want Liat back. Yeah. We want them back. They had the mod the model. Yeah. They knew how to run the airline. The culture. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, we really the governments just need to band together and they need to yeah. come with something. We need to get our airline back. And the Venezuelan state airline Conviasa made its inaugural flight from Havana, Cuba to the Agal International Airport, Heron St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Friday, March 31st, 2023. Addressing the welcoming ceremony, Prime Minister Dr. Raul Gonzalez said day by day his government is enlarging the opportunities in SVG, noting the many opportunities for the airline service for Vincentians, noting that the flight cost is quite reasonable. So we have a lot of opportunities for visits, the parents who have children in Cuba going to university, persons who have families in Cuba, persons who have gone to Cuba or to Venezuela for medical attention, or whatever other activity, you're able to go. I know what you're saying, Comrade Ralph. From here to Cuba, in these difficult times, when you have to watch your money, how am I going to afford that? Well, it might surprise you to know that Argyle to Havana return is only 500 US. Just under 500 US. I want 
That's $1,300 and, cha $1, and change. You know nowadays, it costs you more to go to Trinidad. Um, and, well, don't talk about going to St. Kitts. You have to go to Miami. You have to go north to come south. Um, so this is one of the cheapest fares you can find. Where are you going to travel for nearly four hours? Going and coming for under 500 US dollars in today's, today's day and age. Venezuela's ambassador to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Francisco Perez Santana, said it is indeed an important milestone to celebrate as the inaugural flight of Conviasa to SVG is part of the air service agreement that was signed last year and that it was also a dream of the late President Hugo Chavez in terms of the unity of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are in front of another very important milestone. No? Uh, Part of the, uh, this is part of the air service agreement that we, we signed uh, last year. And it's part of, of course, all the, the we are uh, using the fifth freedom to have this fly to, to, to Cuba and to Venezuela. Um, that was, this was a dream of our liberator, Simon Bolivar and also a dream of our President Chavez, the unity of Latin America and the Caribbean. And with this fly, be sure that we are uh, giving one step to that unity, because this is the window of our Caribbean and the door of Latin America and the door of the Caribbean also. It's the door and the window and is the house of all the people of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. And with this fly we can achieve uh, that unity. Minister of Tourism and Culture Carlos James vocalized the need to build a better relationship with Venezuela and Cuba in regards to a joint marketing initiative to offer package tours to Venezuela and Cuba. We must be able to somehow build a better relationship in terms of that joint marketing initiative. To have persons on package tours, spending a few nights in Havana, and at the same time, boarding a Conviasa flight and spending a few nights here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to discover a ride. And the same exercise for Venezuela and the countries that are bordering the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. So we have a lot of work to do in this regard. But the starting point we're having all of us here is that linkage, which is by far one of the most important ones in all of our engagement as countries, diplomatic relations, the movement of our people between the three countries is an important one. Minister James noted that by next year, 2024, he is hoping to see more flights coming to St. Vincent and the Grandines from major source markets on a daily basis and from the South American continent in the near future. The Havana flight we have roughly just short of a 50% capacity on its first day. And that's also a good sign and an indication of what the potential is there for us to tap into other markets, non-traditional markets, as we, grow, we continue to grow and expand our tourism product. By this time, Next year, we're hoping to see almost on a daily basis flights coming in from major source markets. We're hoping that we can add more flights from the 
South American continent, and also even daily flights from Havana, or twice weekly. The opportunity that this international airport here at Argyle has presented for our tourism product and our local economy is something that we ought not to take for granted. In other news, we hear that April 18, 2023 has been set aside by the court to address the government's legal team application for a sale of execution on the judgment ruled in favor of the public sector unions in the COVID-19 mandate case handed down last month by High Court Judge Justice Esco Henry. This is according to Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalves, who on the radio yesterday elaborated on the government's decision to put forward a notice of appeal and for a sale of execution on the judgment, noting that but at the moment, the government is not in contempt of any court order. Sense will tell you, if you engage in the court process, how you could be in contempt. Mm -hmm. You know that I've said before that I read the judgment, but before I read the judgment, I accepted the advice of senior lawyers, including retired judges, mm -hmm. who are satisfied that the judgment, both on facts and law, are wrong in material ways. So it had to be a people. I, I can't. We have acted in, a, in what we consider to be proper legal, constitutional, in a proportionate manner. This government needs to be clear, and the people of St. Vincent need to be clear, and for succeeding governments too, that whenever there's a pandemic, what we can do and what we can't do. Do you allow the pandemic, a pandemic to rip through and kill people willy-nilly and then say, that's the will of God? Just rely on moral suasion when, when the Constitution permits, in the case of a public health emergency, what is reasonably required, that we can do things which are reasonably required for public safety and for, for, and for public health, and that what we do must be reasonably justifiable in a democratic society. And, and we, are, we are satisfied we acted in, in the manner proportionate to satisfy those tests in every material particular. PM Gonzalves continues to maintain that a ruling handed down by Justice Henry on March 13, 2023 was wrong, hence the reason why the government is appealing. The esteemed judge, Justice Henry, delivered the conclusions of her judgment on the morning of the 13th of March. The Attorney General's chambers received from the court the time I'm told is 4.32 on the same 13th of March, the written order, because it was delivered orally. And she had promised that the judgment will be delivered by the end of the week, the written judgment. Oh, yes. The next day was a public holiday, the 14th. On the Wednesday, some public servants, teachers turned up to work and were told naturally that look, um, the government is, is appealing. They give notice orally of appeal, and they'd be asking for a stay. They'd be making an application for a stay. So there'd be we, all the various arrangements would have to be made administratively in respect of following the judgment. If there is no stay, we did not receive. I've been advised that the judgment was not available until the 20th, the complete judgment. So what, in order for, for the lawyers, for the government to move expeditiously, they put in a notice of appeal with grounds arising from the orders themselves. But I'd said in that appeal, notice of appeal, that they want, they reserve the right upon the receipt of the written judgment, uh, the reasoning, to amend their grounds. Last month, High Court Judge Justice Esco Henry ruled against the government on all but one of the major points of the lawsuit that was brought by the public sector unions over the COVID-19 vaccine mandate, under which hundreds of the nation's public sector workers were deemed to have abandoned or resigned from their jobs in December 2021 for failing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. The workers have maintained that they did not abandon or resign their jobs, as the government claimed, and that they were dismissed in her ruling 
Justice Henry said the special measures rules made under the SRO, the vaccine mandate law, was unlawful, unconstitutional, and void. And on the Teachers Speak program on the radio yesterday, President of the SVG Teachers Union, Oswald Robinson, said the government must have known that it would have lost the case as everything was based on the country's constitution and the constitutional rights of the affected workers. He said their legal team is also preparing for the upcoming hearing on the applications made by the government's legal team for the notice of appeal and stay of execution of the judgment. For example, um, the law of natural justice, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the Bill of Rights in all the constitutions I've read. Mm -hmm. It is the part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights right. and the, the Covenant on Political and Civil Liberties. Simply saying, due process, you must have a hearing right. before you fire somebody mm -hmm. or before you take other measures. Mm -hmm. And that is your right under the law. Mm -hmm. Allah, Allah that says you have a right to be heard. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And they violated that and many other. Right. So when the when the when they indicated in the court that they were going to appeal, it's not automatic. Precisely. They still have to apply to the court. They mm -hmm. still have to inform the court that they're going to appeal, which they would have done. Right. And they would have also asked for a stay. Mm -hmm. Right? A stay means a stay of judgment. Yeah. Right. right. So the, you know, it's like you put it on hold mm -hmm. until you have a hearing. Mm -hmm. So is the stay of judgment automatic? No. Okay. You still, you still, uh, you still have to go to the court and seek the permission mm -hmm. of the court. Mm -hmm. So just talking out there in the public, you still have to follow through the correct procedure mm -hmm. and the channel. And they have done so. Mm -hmm. Like your brother relation, John wants to say yeah, something. I was just thinking in relation to the state of execution that mm -hmm. Brother Rabbi spoke about. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that the court order is still intact, which states that the teachers never lost the job and mm -hmm. should return mm -hmm. to the job is still yes in, in effect. Yes. Right. Right. And that should be that should be honored and yes. recognized. Mm -hmm. And it is disturbing to me that the authority mm -hmm. is seeking without a stay of execution to prevent workers from returning to the judge, to the armed work, as the court order states. They well, were trying to create some sort of a, you know, conflict there and saying that they would have appealed right. and they would have, that does not affect the stay of execution, execution. until the time that the judge says otherwise, if the judge says otherwise. And Industrial Relations Officer of the SVGTU, Andrew John, said the government should respect the ruling handed down by the High Court judge. The, I think it was the Prime Minister who stated that the one judge cannot make an important, such an important, important decision. decision. Yes. Uh -huh. When we say that to our citizens, mm -hmm. that we must not agree with the judge, with the law, with, with the, what the judge mm -hmm. has ruled, mm -hmm. what we are setting is a bad precedence because what we are saying, every individual could follow that example, right? And say, for example, the judge rules that I should be sentenced to a certain period of time. I mean, you say there is that appeal open, but when you are making this statement, mm -hmm. you are setting an example, mm -hmm. and then you are coming back now. The judge says, the judgment states. Mm -hmm. that the teachers were never dismissed and so they should return to their jobs. And you are still coming and telling teachers, reapply, mm -hmm. reapply, which means that you are ignoring the, the, the judgment of the court. Yeah, it is. Right? And when you're, you, that's what I'm saying, you know, I am looking at it from an individual perspective. Mm -hmm. I, as an individual looking on, I am going to say, oh, well, if the authorities cannot respect the courts, why should so, I respect exactly. the courts? Right? Exactly. And we have to understand that we cannot be just putting our emotions and our ego mm -hmm. ahead of everything. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with the issues as they come to hand. Mm -hmm. right. Because remember, our lawyer was saying at the press conference, you know, he wants the judge to, take, I think it's even before the press conference, he wants the judge to take a time because when the judge comes back with a ruling, if we had 12 items mm -hmm. and we would have lost maybe on five or six, then they might, you right. know, there might be room for appeal, it might be grounds. Yes, right. But you're coming and lo losing on everything mm -hmm. that we saw there. Precisely. Everything yes. was either unconstitutional, procedurally wrong, void. Mm -hmm. Rabbi have all the words them there. 
<laughs> and you are saying after that, you are still going to come and tell people that you are going to appeal. Mm -hmm. And the grounds on which you appeal, one of the grounds is that you cannot pay. pay. You cannot pay the workers. The money belongs to the workers. <laughs> but... Meanwhile, President of the SVG TU, Oswald Robinson, used the opportunity to congratulate the Grenada Teachers Union for the recent agreement to reach with the government for a 13% salary increase over the next three years. And some of the same things we saw Grenada now getting, mm -hmm. we had that in our collective agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the teachers, apart from I know St. Lucia, that would get an end of allowance. Mm -hmm. Some of the other unions in the Caribbean, they don't get. Right, right. You know, so... Mm -hmm. so, so we have to give and take. We have to give and take. So that's but point. we want to commend and congratulate the Grenada Teachers Union for, you know, achieving that. Mm -hmm. It's historic because the force they have had uh, such a large increase over. And I know the brother, the brother president, the battle me. Mm -hmm. He has been, you know, advocating for me to meet government because it's a similar thing in the Caribbean among governments where government don't want to come and meet with the individual units and so on but it was good it happened in grenada mm -hmm. so i want to commend the brother i know he's very dedicated and just before the signing my I, I listened to him mm -hmm. attentively on one of the radio programs in grenada and right he was very articulate mm -hmm. and he's one of the soldiers in the cut you know um, <laughs> very very good yeah. dedicated hard and what brother john has said is quite true the when you listen to the remarks by the Prime yes, Minister so. of Grenada at the, after he had signed. Mm -hmm. I am paraphrasing. He actually said that the teachers mm -hmm. is the staff of the nation, not only of the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. and therefore you need to treat them properly. Mm -hmm. And rewarding... He, in fact, he admitted you can't really pay teachers for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And he, he made a fundamental point. He said, instead of having all this bad relationship when it comes to industrial relations over salary it's better you get it right yeah. right and he's right. making pre he's making preparation to meet with the other unions mm -hmm. chief statistician in the ministry of finance economic planning and information technology lavon williams said they are ready for a takeoff with the 2023 national housing and population census addressing the official launch on friday at the nis conference room williams said the multi-sectorial census advisory committee the technical working group and the staff at the statistical office in the ministry of finance economic planning and information technology have been working hard to execute this year's census which is not been an easy feat. The data collection period runs from June 16 to September 15, 2023, so we are anticipating a 12, 12 weeks data collection. The census is the largest statistical undertaking to be conducted in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is authorized and protected under the Census and Statistics Act, number 24 of 1983. The Act requires everyone throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines to participate in the census. The census is that important. The legal mandate and responsibility for conducting the population and housing census lies with the statistical office. Briefly, the historical context for census taken in St. Vincent and the Grenadines dates back to 1871. Although the first modern census was undertaken in 1945, since then, censuses have been undertaken virtually every 10 years. For the period 1960, 70, 80, 1991, 2001, and 2012. Interestingly, this 2023 census falls within the 2015-2024 period decreed by the United Nations World Population Fund as the current um, period of global censuses. According to Williams, the census is the headcount of every person living in St. Vincent and Grenadines and is the only data source that provides detailed information or microdata at the lowest geographical level, providing information to inform government planning and policies for businesses to make decisions regarding the population for community outreach programs, emergency response strategies, and information on the housing stock in the country. She said the housing and population census is conducted every 10 years with the last census conducted 
conducted in 2012, showing the population at 109,091. However, since then, many changes have taken place as she outlined the key accomplishments and preparations made to date for Census 2023. Preparation for the Census began way in 2019. An internal technical working group was formed to manage the various elements of the census. The committee comprised of staff of the statistical office and the com economic unit. Weekly meetings were held to plan for census activities and these meetings continue. A project planner is used to keep the census on track. From on June 1st, cabinet gave approval for the establishment of a census advisory committee for a period of 18 months. This multi-sectorial committee was tasked with the responsibility for the conduct, for the oversee of the conduct of the census. The committee comprises of eight, 18 representatives, as I said, is a multi-sectorial um, committee. To date, the CSE has completed a review of the 2023 census legislation. This was submitted to the Attorney General's Chambers for review to facilitate the timely publication of the 2023 census and statistics legislation. Without the legislation, the Statistical Office does not have the authority to go in the field to collect the data. An advocacy team comprising staff of the Statistical Office and the CSC was formed to promote the census. As part of the advocacy trust, the slogan, which we are, by now we can all repeat, was developed from, from that committee. Or, um, also, by way of a competition, and we asked for a request for some proposal, a logo, and the census, census jingle, and a song were developed. Census Day, Aaron St. Vincent and Grenadines is June 15, 2023. And a two-day workshop on improving psychosocial support for students, teachers, and families of vulnerable populations affected by the coronavirus and other hazards started here today at the NIS conference room. The workshop is supported by the Ministry of Economic Planning and the Caribbean Development Bank. Project coordinator in the Ministry of Economic Planning, David Tellisford, said the program is a multi-pronged approach to tackling the effects of the pandemic head-on with the involvement of a number of government ministries. Chief Education Officer K. Martin Jack said given the effects of the pandemic compounded by the eruption of Lazofre volcano, which disrupted lives, challenging interaction and security, the Ministry of Education has been doing its part to improve in mental health by provi providing psychosocial support to teachers, students and families impacted by these hazards. This initiative then is an extension of all the services which are already offered by the Ministry of Education in the area of mental and psychosocial support. We recognize that the journey to wholeness is a continuous one and that it requires additional resources and support. Often in times of disaster or crisis situations, the focus is on providing the basic needs, particularly food and shelter. However, according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there are three areas which are most important, namely basic needs, psychological needs, and self-fulfillment needs. The Ministry of Education and National Reconciliation recognizes there's the importance of having these needs met and have taken deliberate steps to assist homes and the school communities to provide these needs to all our students, teachers, and administrators in all of our schools in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We are working with stakeholders and are making considerable strides to provide assistance through various school feeding programs the Zero Hunger Trust Fund, Musty Charitable Trust, and the Thirsty Water Initiative, to name a few. The Chief Education Officer, however, noted that whilst they recognize that they have done considerable work in the area of providing support for the cycle 
social needs of those in their care. They also recognize that they have far to go to catch up to the standards set in other countries. The need for further capacity development for guidance counselors and teachers in providing crisis sensitive psychosocial support for students and families. Clear referral processes for those seeking or needing psychosocial support or mental health services. Communication material regarding COVID-19 risk awareness and self-care as well as available mental health services. And obviously to improve monitoring and evaluation of psychosocial support intervention. It is quite timely, therefore, that we are engaging in this training. Teachers, your involvement in this session is a sign of your commitment to the students who are in your care. Students who are in an ever-evolving world and who require our help in helping them to navigate it. Your presence has brought to fruition the Ministry of Education's involvement in providing the support required following the COVID-19 outbreak and the volcanic eruption of 2021. I must say a heartfelt thank you, teachers, for being a part of the process at this time. Particularly so when I'm certain that some of you had already planned your Easter vacation. <laughs> I want to applaud your commitment to bettering yourselves so that you might invest more profoundly in your stakeholders, namely your students, teachers, and parents. Thank you for your efforts and for wanting to make a better St. Vincent and Martin Jack pledged the Ministry of Education's commitment to exposing teachers to continuous learning opportunities, which he said are capable of having far-reaching benefits that will not only enhance a teachers' ability, but provide support to students, teachers, parents, schools, and the entire education sector.